When Christ said you were faithful in very little, if you were to look at that context and do a, a proper exegesis of what Jesus was meaning, he was meaning your faithfulness equals the result. Somehow we've taken that word and we've messed it up big time that we try hard or that we do the same thing every day and no matter what, we're there. That's consistency. In this passage, faithfulness was equal to taking one and making 10. So there is more to come from Bruce Wilkinson on the topic of doing business exponentially on this episode of FCCI's Pathway to Purpose podcast. Our goal through this podcast is to encourage and inspire Christian business owners, entrepreneurs, leaders just like yourself as we engage in conversation around content captured at FCCI conferences and events through the years. And on this episode, I'm welcoming Kathy Ferguson from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Alan Bass from Reno, Nevada. Thanks to both of you for being part of today's podcast. Thank you for the invite. This is a great opportunity. Thank you, Ken. We really appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you. Uh, it is great to have both of you here. And Kathy, knowing that uh, you have been a part of what's been going on there in the Albuquerque, New Mexico market, spending time with Daniel Higby yes. and Paul Jew, just some wonderful people. And share with us a little bit about uh, the calling that yes. God's placed on your life and how you've gotten to where you are in your business ministry today. Well, like I was saying, telling you earlier, I feel God has a sense of humor. Um, I have been a medical biller, medical billing investigator for oh, around 30 years here in Albuquerque. I work nationally. Medical debt resolution serves consumers, patients concerned with uh, medical bills, the amounts they owe, what are they paying for? And um, I have been given a great gift and I serve people, I serve God first. And um, it's, it's just so helpful what I do for people. Mm. Well, I was a difference. Yeah, it sure does. Uh, As you were sharing a little bit earlier (laughs) about um, how you got into this role and how God has uh, allowed you opportunity to uncover um, incredible opportunities for savings and reimbursement for errors in billing. Yes. I know others are very, very thankful for the work that you do, and I can appreciate that very (laughs) much. So. Thank you for that. And Alan, uh, of course, you've been involved with FCCI for just a few years now, right? And uh, we're so thankful for the impact that you've had in so many lives there in the Reno area. So share with us more about uh, the work that God's been doing in your life, the work that he called you into, and and how that's led to this FCCI involvement. Uh, Thanks, Ken. Uh, It's been an amazing uh, buggy ride for a guy that showed up without a buggy. But uh, 50 plus years in the business arena, uh, working for large corporations early on and then uh, doing a startup for a venture capital group uh, back in the uh, late 80s and into the 90s. Uh, We were able to take that company public and then uh, purchased a, a small business, family owned business. Uh, for the last uh, 23 years of that career. So very interesting uh, career, blessed indeed in so many different ways. And then uh, about 25 years ago, got involved with FCCI and uh, God began to uh, help me understand what stewardship is all about. Hmm. Uh, we, We don't need to act more like owners. We kind of do that naturally. But uh, being a steward is a whole different ball game. So I spent the last uh, 23 years in particular in our own business trying to understand what that actually meant. Uh, been involved with FCCI here in Reno since we moved our business here from California in uh, 2001 and just uh, been an amazing journey. I'm excited to to talk more about what Bruce shares here today um, in this segment with both of you, knowing that 
you've got wonderful experience and you've been a part of seeing business done well, probably been able to see business not done well um, as you've uh, journeyed alongside so many others through the years. But I, I'm looking forward to us hearing more about uh, what Bruce has to share here about what does it really mean to do business exponentially until the return of Christ and what we what he believes uh, Jesus is sharing with us here from this parable of the Mina. So let's listen to Bruce and we'll come back in just a few minutes. The older I get, the more I'm convinced that life is simply a testing ground so that Christ can reward you or me depending upon what we proved we were like here. That's why we're here. This is only a short lifetime, but the next period is eternity forever. When Christ said you were faithful in very little, If you were to look at that context and do a a proper exegesis of what Jesus was meaning, he was meaning your faithfulness equals the result. Somehow we've taken that word and we've messed it up big time that we try hard or that we do the same thing every day and no matter what, we're there. That's consistency. In this passage, faithfulness was equal to taking one and making ten. That's the results. That's what got the well done. That's what got the good and faithful servant. And that's what got an extraordinary result. I don't know if you studied the scripture much, but after the tribulation that occurs and the second coming of Jesus, the world will have been destroyed. And Jesus will begin rebuilding it And he will be placing people over literal cities depending upon what they did in this lifetime. The next verse has to do with the incremental productivity and the reward of the five mina business person. This is the verse that changed my life. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, a well done. No, he didn't. Good servant. No, he didn't. You be over 10 cities. No, he didn't. He made it proportionate. You multiplied five. I will give you based upon that five. And I remember in the middle of the night as I was meditating on this, saying to the Lord, why didn't you say, well done? Why didn't you say, good servant? And I got one of these rare times in which the Lord answers your question because he could have had 10 and he didn't. He could have had more than 10. And when that was there, I asked myself the question I'm asking you now. Are you a 10 mean a person? Have you taken your life the years that you have, the talents that Almighty God gave to you, the situation where you're in, and have you grown it for the kingdom in any context you want it to be in 10 times? And I came to the conclusion that night, I wasn't a 10 mean a person. I didn't know that till then, but I wasn't. And I was feeling so convicted. And the next morning I shared with Darlene uh, when we were having breakfast about this issue and then went to walk through the Bible and said to the organization, uh, we're not a 10 mina organization and I'm not a 10 mina leader and I don't know how to get there, but we're gonna get there. And that began a lifelong, from that point to this day, pursuit of learning the secrets of how do you become a 10 mina person? How do you become a 10 mina company? How do you become a 10 mina ministry? Part six, the poor productivity and loss of the one mina business person. Because we do not understand the nature of God 
we do not believe there's any consequence to how productive we are in our lifetime. The vast majority of Christians around the world do not aggressively serve God in their business, in their life, because they believe only half the truth. The half the truth is, I put my faith in Jesus Christ as my personal savior, my sins are forgiven, I'm given the gift of eternal life and I'm entering into heaven and that is true. And that is wonderful. But the second half of that is what you do from the point you're born again to the point in which you die determines what happens to you when you get there. When the Bible teaches the fact that he will wipe away every tear Do you realize that's in heaven that he's wiping away tears? That is not on earth. And wiping away the tears is related directly to when we see all the truth that what I did in my life here determines about everything there. You never lose heaven. You never lose heaven because heaven is a gift. But what you earn is not a gift. It is earned. And this passage right here is the second part of this parable that I've never recovered from. I changed, I changed how I viewed Jesus. Verse number 20, then came another, the third one. Master, here is your mina, which I've kept put away in my handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an austere man. Look up here for a minute. Now, austere means a bit harsh holding people accountable to results. And I thought to myself, Jesus isn't an austere man. Because I was thinking of Jesus at the first coming when he came as a lamb, the lamb of God, never to answer back, never to fight back, to take it all, to be beaten, to be scourged, and to be crucified. I wasn't thinking about Jesus, not in his first role but his eternal role. His eternal role is the sovereign king. And I was mixing up this role with this role when he's the lion of Judah coming this time. And with his sword out of his mouth, he will destroy the nations. That's what he says. So when this man said, I feared you because you were an austere man, I argued with that inside because my picture of Jesus was just this side which is a specific assignment from the Father to him. You collect, said this man, what you didn't deposit and reap what you did not sow. Is that true? Absolutely. He gave each person a mina, and he didn't sow. He left, and we sowed. And he then gets to collect and reap what he didn't sow, but we sowed. So I thought to myself, wait a minute now. What does the Bible actually teach? Well, look what Jesus said about what he said. And Jesus said to this man, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. Read, read this with me. You knew that I was an austere man. That's enough. Jesus validates he is a, he is a king who holds people accountable. You knew that I was an austere man. You knew that I do collect what I didn't deposit and reap what I didn't, so why then didn't you put my money in the bank that at my coming I've collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, part seven, the shocking consequence of personal, a lack of personal productivity, and he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him. Whoa, that's where, that's where the tears are shed. And we could talk about this the rest of the day. And give it to the one who has 10 minas. My goodness. But they said to him, Master, he's already got 10 minas. It's not fair. Heaven is not socialistic. (laughs) It is not all the same. If you've traveled the world, you go to any socialistic country and every communistic country I've been in, I've been in a lot of them, 60-some countries. When God had the Jews come into the promised land, what did he say? Divided up into 12 tribes 
And every single family gets a piece of property because that's how you make a living in those days. You either farmed it or you grew the animals. And if by chance anybody in your family line really gets into economic problems and either you sell your land or you have to put yourself in slavery, every 50 years the land goes back to the family. Private ownership is God's idea. And consequences from our behavior is God's idea. Heaven is heaven, but what happens to us in heaven is totally up to us. But I, he said, mastery is ten minas. <laughs> For I say to you that everyone has will be given and to him does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Well, what literally happened? He took the mina from the person and he gave it to the individual that had been most productive. He didn't give it to the guy who took one and made five. I remember a businessman coming up to me saying that that was wrong. I said, you're telling me Jesus was wrong. <laughs> well, I wasn't saying that, but that's not fair. What's not fair? He shouldn't have taken it. He's not going to have anything. I said, well, who decided that? I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a stockbroker. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Let's say I took my portfolio and put it with three different stockbrokers. At the end of the year, this guy made 3%, this guy made 11%, and this guy made 43%. <laughs> what would you do with the money, sir? Ah, oh, man, I'd rip it out of this guy's hand and put it over here. Sounds like you think like Jesus. <laughs> yeah, but do you actually embrace that is who Jesus is? If you don't, just read the prophets. So this morning, okay. I woke up um, still about half asleep this morning when I got up and I was getting ready to launch into one of our FCCI virtual groups. And uh, in doing so, I was reading from Daniel chapter one. And God just shocked me awake this morning with a phrase at the end mm -hmm. of the chapter. It's in verse 20 where it says this. Whenever the king consulted them in a matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them, now get this, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. So here we are hearing from Bruce Wilkinson today on the podcast about this 10x return. And here is an example, the book of Daniel, folks that are living in this Babylonian captivity or in this, mm -hmm. in this uh, culture that would stand very much in opposition to who they were um, in their upbringing and their faith. And yet here they are getting a 10x return, even in that culture, in that environment. And Bruce talked about in this podcast episode, life is a testing ground and we're here to prove mm -hmm. our faithfulness. Testing ground. Oh my goodness. There's been so many times it's like, you know, in prayer, why, why God? And then look, look at his glory. Look what perceives, look what it's just trusting and believing and being faithful to him. You know, he does such mighty works. And there's so many times it's like, just be still, Cap. Listen, just be still. You'll, it's, you'll, the understanding will be here. <laughs> For years, I struggled personally with God testing me. You know, it's like, why do you keep testing me? And uh, over time, I began to realize that he wanted to grow me. He wanted to mature me. He wanted me to be more like Jesus in every area of my life. And I obviously was not like Jesus. So there had to be some testing there had to be some trials and by the way we do this in business we do it uh with people that we work with on an ongoing basis uh, we try to find out just you know how mature they are how strong they are what their strengths and weaknesses are mm -hmm. so the whole idea of testing over time began to take a different meaning for me and I began to see it as the love of God uh, giving me opportunities to grow, giving me opportunities to grow closer to him in particular, to be more like him so that he could, in fact, use me uh, in, a, in a far greater way. Mm. So it, it just took on a whole different 
meaning for me. Yeah. Well, how about this thought that uh, Bruce shared? The vast majority do not aggressively serve God in their business and life. And just your thoughts around how you have seen either folks maybe not being as aggressive as they should be or times when you felt like God was moving you to say, yeah, let's be a little more aggressive. And, and what does that really mean? How does that play out in real life? There's been many times when I just feel him lifting me up by the shoulders and putting me in front of a situation and the words to say and how I mm-hmm. act. And Kathy, earlier, you shared with me the story before we got on the air here and started recording. You shared with me how you really kind of stepped into what you do today. Would you mind sharing that? Because that was a bit of an aggressive step that you took. And that was such a blessing to hear that story and that testimony. Share that with us if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I just, um, I've had this experience as an employee and um, just seeing consistent financial mistakes and patients' medical bills. And um, with a health insurance company, I um, kept finding mistakes where the company I worked for was not being paid correctly. And this exceeded just under $2 million mistake with the health insurance. And patients were severely overcharged. And I, you know, like, I need an investigation. I needed an audit. And then the accounting department came to me with a check for $487,000 and said, what did you do? And I'm like, thank you, God, you know, (laughs) and patients are calling with, I got check in the mail. What is this? And God's like, this is your work. This is this is what I want you to do. And I opened medical debt resolutions. To step into that and see that opportunity and to take yes. take the right action. And uh, Bruce talked about sometimes we kind of get sold on the story that's a bit of a half-truth that salvation is kind of the end. And what he's telling us in, in this podcast episode is, no, there's there's a second mm-hmm. half. There's there's the next step, right? We get saved. And then there's this process of what is it we do from then to the end, whether we pass away, Jesus returns, whatever comes first, that at that point, there is going to be a measurement and there's going to be an accounting and to say what happened and what Bruce shared in that about the rewards in heaven. It's just such a powerful truth. And I'm just curious if at at some point Mm -hmm. in your life that this, uh, maybe Alan, Kathy, when, when did that truth kind of become an awareness to you? You, you, you discovered that in fact, God has an intent to provide rewards and that we have responsibility. Well, the salvation thing is, is truly a gift from God, something Mm -hmm. that, that none of us, uh, deserve, none of us can earn. Uh, but once once we receive that gift, once we're adopted into his family, uh, and we have two adopted daughters, and we are very thankful for them, but once we're adopted into the family, we're full-blown family members, and we're supposed to be about our father's business. And uh, maybe 20 years ago, we did a study, a a group of men and myself did a study on heaven, a book written by Randy Alcorn. And when you think deeply about heaven, you know, I think it's C.S. Lewis said, if you shoot for heaven, you get, you get earth thrown in. And there's a lot of truth in that because when you shoot for heaven and you begin to live as if, um, what you do here on earth matters in heaven it gives you a whole different perspective. And that's a, that's some of what Bruce, I think was, was communicating. And the, the key for me has been, and I think for many of us, this tension that we're called to live in, you know, faith, uh, You know, we have to live by faith. Scripture talks a lot about that. But then there's work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. There's God's part and there's my part. And God doesn't do my part for me. Mm -hmm. And I certainly can't do God's part Mm -hmm. in the process. So it's living in that tension 
and allowing God to to have full reign in our lives. It's it's uh, using the tools that He gives us in the most effective way. And how about this? The the idea that I. I think was wow. just so yeah so powerful from Bruce was when he made the mention of heaven is not socialistic and when he said that it certainly strikes a chord with me uh, because we we are given tasks mm. to do we are we there is a, a reason for us being on planet earth and it and it's not just to enjoy the the, the blessings that uh, many of us think it's all about. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, reminded of 15 years ago or so, uh, God grabbed my heart and I was looking at what's going on in culture, all the different changes in culture. And God says, you know, a lot of this has taken place on your watch because you've been busy doing a lot of other things that maybe I haven't even called you to do. And so from here on out, I want you to be more on point doing what I call you to do so that uh, some of these things may be addressed. And so I got a, I got a, a wake up call and uh, also again, a reminder that what we do on earth has rewards in heaven. If we think we're going to get rewarded on earth, then we've already got our reward. Yeah. So we can forget about that in heaven. But anything that really is going to have an eternal value has to be done under his direction, under his supervision, through his power, through his spirit. And uh, from there, we can rest assured that those treasures will be uh, enjoyed for an eternity. What a, what a yay, God, you know, eternal life. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that we're going to yeah. be there and how we get to serve and see mm -hmm. our almighty God and be a leader, be one of his leaders. One more thought there too, Ken, is the work. Uh, I, it's amazing to me how many people think that work is a curse hmm. work is actually a huge blessing yeah. in our lives yeah, and god knows that god gave it to us for that reason mm -hmm. so we get an opportunity to work as unto the lord here on this earth and then when we go into eternity um whether it's ruling and reigning with christ in the in the uh in the new earth or whatever it is that God has for us, it's going to be very meaningful work. And I think about the best teams that I've ever worked with on this earth and how rewarding it's been to achieve things as a team. And then think about that in heaven where you don't have the, the same kind of negative influences here on earth, you have a very positive environment to work in. Mm -hmm. And just think about what can be accomplished there and what a blessing yeah. that is. Absolutely. One of the studies that we've been going through in an FCCI group um, really speaks to that fact, Alan, the, the, the fact that as an organization, we're meant to hold back the chaos. We're meant to reduce the chaos of this world and, and entirely for the purpose of delivering on the image of God through ourselves and through our organization that we're in fact to deliver on what they describe as the IOS of, of the Trinity, the, the fact that there, there is this wonderful relationship that's going on between the Father, Son, and Spirit where there is interdependence, there's overflowing love and there's shared purpose. And that's the IOS. And just this idea of that as the, as the Trinity functions in that way with itself, within itself, that in fact, that God, that creator God intends for us to display that as image bearers. And as we do that in this world, that we stem the chaos, we hold back the chaos and bring peace and prosperity as we're called to do 
where we're planted and how powerful that is. And then, as you said, you know, here we are doing that work. What a blessing it is to have that work. What a blessing it is to engage in that work. And all the while, then that brings us to a place of having such wonderful rewards in heaven to the glory of God, for his glory, for his purpose. Uh, how wonderful and amazing that plan, that ecosystem that God's designed and put together for us to participate in, how powerful that is. I was I was fortunate to be in the audience when when Bruce presented that. You know, I think it was in 2015. And uh, it's amazing the takeaway today versus my takeaway in 2015. Um, because the, this living in the tension has become more and more real for me because we have a tendency to either uh, bask in the love of God and uh, ignore the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. We don't, we don't balance things very well as people. And the quantity and the quality is a part of that whole thing. You know, there's uh, doing shoddy work is not as unto the Lord from what I can gather. I don't see that any place in scripture, but uh, being a perfectionist, uh, I've heard people refer to that as sin. Okay, excellence is a is a good thing to pursue, but per perfection here on this earth is not going to happen. Uh, so, living in that in that um, tension is is what I think we're called to do. And I just, when I, when I heard the, or when we reviewed the, the uh, message from Bruce again, one of the things that I heard loud and clear that I don't think I heard initially was how much of an impact this had on Bruce's life because he struggled with this. It was, it was like, you know, you read something in scripture that hits you right between the eyes and you have a choice. You can either deal with it and say, Lord, I know you've got something here for me. Or we can, uh, I think as um, G.F. Chesterton talked about, you know, uh, being faced with the truth. Many people get up and, and walk off as if nothing ever happened. So we can either deal with what we are confronted with and grow and move to a different level, or we can just move on and have nothing change in our life. So anyway, it was it was great to go back and review this. And I'm reminded one last thought. Uh, I need to be reminded more than I need to be taught. Because there's so many things that I've already been exposed to that I'm just not pulling out. Which, by the way, I hate to do this, but small groups are, are huge. And have been in my life and my FCCI group over the last 20 years has been one of the things that have has allowed me to continue to grow and change because without that one-on-one -on -one, uh, life experience week after week after week, uh, it's likely that uh, I would be uh, more like I was 20 years ago and I didn't need to spend time there. I needed to, to move forward to something better. Well, my thanks to Kathy and Alan for their part in this podcast episode. We'll enjoy another conversation with a Christian business leader just like you on our next episode. So be sure to let others know about the Pathway to Purpose podcast. And do check out FCCI.org and all the ways that the Fellowship of Companies for Christ can serve you. Until next time, may God encourage your journey as you lead a company for Christ. Thank you.